Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. I hope you guys are doing extremely well. So this is another lecture from the Strivers A to Z DSA course. Just in case you're for the first time here, this is world's most in-depth course on DS Algo. Why do I say that? Because in this course, I'll be covering over 455 modules and we will be solving more than 400 plus problems. You can go across the internet by any of the paid courses on DS Algo. None of them will be covering DS Algo in such depth. So once you complete this particular course, you can actually clear any of the DS Algo rounds in any of the companies in any part of the world. So till now we have covered until step 3.1 this particular problem. In this video, I will be covering all these five problems. In case you want a solution for a particular problem, the timestamps will be there. You can switch between problems if you want to do that. So without waiting, let's get started with the first problem that is finding missing number in an array. So what does the problem state? The problem states you'll be given an n and you'll be given n minus one numbers. Okay. So these n minus one numbers will be containing numbers between one to n. So if you see one is there, two is there, four is there, five is there. Who is not there? Yes, three is not there. So your answer will be three because three is not here. Since three is not here, the answer will be three. So you have to find the number that is not there between one to n. In this case, one to five. So one, two, three, four, five. One was there, two was there, four was there, five was there, three was not there. So this is what the problem states. So if this question comes up in an interview, the first solution that you will be giving is definitely the brute force solution because you will never jump to the optimal solution because it's you who has to drive the interview. So what is the brute force solution? The brute force will be like, okay, I know the numbers will be from one to n. So it'll be like, cool, let's take one. Does one exist? Yes. So one is not my answer. Let's take two. Does two exist? Yes. So two is not my answer. Let's take three. Does three exist? No. So three is my answer. So what I will do is I will take every number and I'll check in the array if it exists or not by linear search. And if it doesn't, then that's my answer. So that will be the initial brute force solution. How will the code look like? Let's check it out. So basically you say for, I know the numbers will be from I till N. That's something which I know for sure. Now let's do a linear search for I and T J equal to zero J lesser than I know the size is n minus one. So j less than n minus one and j plus plus. What I do is I know the number is i. If array of j is like we can just scroll through and figure out figure it out if it does exist. So flag can be set as maybe uh, zero. And if this is equal to equal to i, I can say that yes, it does exist, and we can break out. Quite simple. And this can be inside the if and outside this for I can say if flag is still zero, which means this number was not there because if this number would have been there at any moment, flag would have turned to one. So if the number is not there, I know my answer. Like you can directly go ahead and say, I know my answer is I quite simple. You pick up one, you check entirely. Does it exist? You pick up two, you check entirely, does it exist? You pick up three, you check entirely, does it exist or not? So what will be the time complexity? Two loops, one for n, the other near about n. So can I say two loops? It means the time complexity, the worst case, if I, if the last number is not found and this gets executed at the last, last, assume five was not here. Assume five was not here and three was here. In this case, the loop will entirely run from one to five. And when it comes to five, it will not find five. So the worst case will be this loop runs entirely and this loops keep on, keeps on running every time. Like that's, that's nearly the worst case, not exactly the worst case because a lot of times you'll find here. So the loop will break. So I can say the worst case, which is again, very impractical. So the worst case is kind of N square. Again, it's a hypothetical scenario because when you're looking for one, you found one here and you broke out. When you are looking for two, you found two here, you broke out. So this will never go till the end. So it's a hypothetical scenario. Got it? That's how you explain to the interview. And the space complexity used is B of one. 
that's my brute force solution this is how you should explain to the interviewer so that your thought process your concept clarity is clearly visible to the interviewer so when you tell the brute force solution to the interviewer he'll definitely not be happy and he'll ask you to optimize it that's when you go across and give him the better solution not the optimal one and you'll say maybe i can use hashing and how will you use hashing so you know the numbers are between 1 to 5 and if you want to hash 5 somewhere you need that fifth index so if you need the fifth index you will have to declare an array of size 6 as your hash array so in the hash array i will declare the array of size 6 i go ahead and declare the array of size 6 if you declare the array hash array of size 6 then you will get the fifth index which will be your last index now what you will do is once you have declared the hash array you'll start iterating 1 you'll go and mark 1 and rest everyone initially would be 0 then you'll go to 2 mark it as 1 then you'll go to 4 you'll mark it as 1 then you'll go to 5 you'll mark it as 1 done once you have marked everything as 1 you will reiterate from 1 to 5 you will iterate from 1 to 5 in the hash array and you'll figure out who is not marked so when you go this is marked this is marked oh wait this is not marked so 3 is your number so 3 is your answer so we can easily solve it using hashing as well let's look at the code so the code is going to be super simple i'll be like okay hash of size n plus 1 and everything will be initially zero and then we will be going across and saying let's go across the array and i know for that array element i have to mark in the hash array so array element is array of i so i go to the hash and say plus plus or i can say mark equal to 1 i can i can simply say mark equal to 1 done once i have done this i know the numbers are from 1 to n so i'll go from 1 to n and i'll say if my hash of i if my hash of i is equal to equal to 0 that is going to be my answer that is going to be my answer and this will be your answer whenever you find out the hash i to be 0 so what will be the time complexity let's analyze a single bigo of n loop and another bigo of n loop so it's a time complexity of 2n at the worst case so if i ask you about the space complexity that's definitely bigo of n because we are using a hash array in order to hash all the elements so that we can remember which one was not present got it so that will be your better solution also when the interviewer again here's the better solution he'll be like okay we did work on the time complexity but now i'm not impressed with the space can we optimize the space complexity or not now this is when you'll come up with the optimal solution now remember one thing this problem can have two optimal solutions one is the sum the other one is the sort and i'll tell you both and i'll tell you the minor difference between them so something i know for sure is if n is 5 the numbers in them will be 1 2 3 4 5 and if i sum them up if i sum them up i know in order to sum up the first n natural numbers the formula goes as n into n plus 1 by 2 very basic maths so it's like 5 into 6 by 2 so the summation is 15 you can also sum it up you will get 15 so that is the summation of the first n natural numbers now i will go across and i will take an s2 and i'll start iterating okay one maybe i'll just erase this So that i can reiterate so i'll i'll go to 1 and like add up 1 so 1 added then i'll go to 2 add up 2 so this will become 3 then i'll go to 4 add up 4 that will become 7 then i'll go to 5 add up 5 so i'll be like okay 12 so we have 12 now if one number is missing then can i say 15 and 12 the difference will be that one number because you summed up every one whom did you not sum up the one number that is missing so if you have to take the summation of the first n and summation of one missing so what will be a missing number yes your missing number will be sum minus s2 your missing number will be sum minus s2 so it's very simple you say summation to have a formula of n into n plus 1 by 2 and then you say for i equal like you can keep s2 equal to 0 i equal to 0 to n and you can keep s2 plus equal to array of i and your number will be quite simple summation minus s2 will be your number very very simple so this is how 
the summation works, what will be the time complexity? We are just running a single loop in order to summate all the array elements. This is a straightaway formula. So the time complexity is big of n and the space complexity is big of 1. Is it better? Like this, this is the best we can do. But we can still do better. That is SOR. Now you might ask me, but Strava, how can you do a better with SOR? That's when I'll explain you this. Let's understand. So coming to the second optimal solution that I was talking about that involves ZOR. Now, a lot of people might not be knowing ZOR. Do not worry. I'll be covering ZOR in depth when I cover the bit manipulation part. But as of now, just understand one concept of ZOR. That is, if you ZOR same numbers, the ZOR of that is always zero. What do I mean by same numbers? If you say 2 ZOR 2, it will be zero. If you say 5 ZOR 5, it will be zero. If you say 2 ZOR 2, ZOR 5 ZOR 5, that will also be zero. Why? This in itself is zero. This in itself is zero. Zero ZOR 0 will also be zero. Got it? If you say something like 2 ZOR 2 ZOR 2 ZOR 2, then it will be like zero, ZOR 0, that will be zero. If I say 2 ZOR 2 ZOR 2 ZOR 2 ZOR 2, it will be like this is zero, this is zero, ZOR with 2. So this is zero, ZOR with 2. And zero ZOR with any number, is the number itself, is the number itself. This is the thing that you have to remember. Nothing else. Th that's the thing that you have to remember. So coming to the most optimal solution. So I hope you have understood till now. N is 5. So when I say N is 5, I know N natural numbers. It's like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I know 5 natural numbers are these. And if I write this, will it be like 1, 2, 4, 5. Do you, can you somehow relate this to ZOR? You can. You'll say, Striver, what I can say is, there are same. So if I, if I try to do a ZOR, each of them will be 0. And only this guy will be left. Because I know 0 ZOR any number is any number. I'm like, yeah, that's true. So what I will do is, I'm like, okay, fine. Let's do one thing. Let's take a variable ZOR1. And in that, in that, do this. And remember when you do this, there will be a number stored. So we have understood, right? Okay, ZOR1 is done. What about ZOR2? I will take ZOR2 and I'll be like, iterate through the array. Let's iterate through the array. So if I iterate through the array, 1 is at first, then there is 2, then there is 4, then there is 5. So ZOR2 is computed. This will be a certain number which will be computed. But in the back of the number, the computer knows, the computer knows that this is what it means mathematically. I know a number will be generated, but mathematically it still means this. So what will happen is, if you do a ZOR of 1, ZOR of 2, what will happen? Yes. Yes. This and this will be together, which will be 0. 2 and 2 will be together, which will be 0. Then 3 and there's no one with 3. So 3 will be alone. 4 and 4 will be 0. And there is 5, which will again be 0. 5 and 5. So this 3 is alone. So apparently 0s or 3 will be 3. So you get the number 3 because they will cut off. They will cut off each other. They will cut off each other. And the only number remaining will be 3. Quite simple. So in order to implement this, how do you write the code? It'll be like, let's take ZOR1 equal to 0. And then we start from, sorry, 1. And we go on till n. And we go like ZOR1 equal to ZOR1 i. And I know the array size is, like we need ZOR2. So ZOR2 equal to 0. The array size goes on till n minus 1. Whether this will be n minus 1. And I know ZOR2 will be ZOR2, ZOR array of i. Quite simple. So apparently ZOR1 is computed. ZOR2 is computed. So the answer is ZOR1, ZOR of ZOR2. This will be your missing number. Can I say this will be your missing number? I can. And that's what you can easily return. Fine. We have solved the problem where we have returned the answer. Now the question comes up. But Striver. We are using two for loops. Hence, the complexity is 2n. How is this better? 
than this one. I'm like, I can still do it. Up. I can still do something. Okay, let's erase this loop. I'm like, no, I will not run an extra loop. I will not run an extra loop in order to compute that. I will try to put the ZOR one over here. So this loop is running like if n is 5, this loop is running from 0 to 3. Can I see this? This loop is running from 0 to 3. Why? Because the indexing is 0, 1, 2, 3. So the loop is running from 0 to 3. So if I write something like this, ZOR1 equal to ZOR1 ZOR i plus 1, what will happen? The loop that is running from 0 to 3 will end up ZORing 1 because instead of 0, I took i plus 1. So it's like 1, ZOR2, ZOR3, ZOR4. Because 0 to 3 means 1 more. So apparently this will mean I'm running from 1 to 4 because I did a i plus 1. So I've, I've ZOR'd everything in place for ZOR1. But if you remember ZOR1 was taking every 1 till 5. So 5, the n, the n is not ZOR'd. So at the end of the day, you can say after the for loop, ZOR1 will have to ZOR with n as well. Because it did ZOR till 4, it requires n. Once you've done this, you can do this. So now the big of 2n boils down to big of n. And that's how you explain it to the interviewer because this is this will tell him about your thought process, about your thinking ability. Got it done? Now, if I have two, which one is better? Apparently, this one is slightly better. Why? Imagine n is given as 10 to the power 5 and summation is doing n into n plus 1, which means somewhere like 10 to the power 5 into 10 to the power 5 plus 1 divided by 2, which is nearly 10 to the power 10, nearly. And this cannot be stored in an integer. It will overflow. So you need a bi like bigger data type, something like a long. And if you take a bigger data type, I'm not saying it is going to take a massive space. Slight, slight more memory will be required. That's why this is better. Why? I did tell you, when we do ZOR, the ZOR never exceeds the largest number. So at max, the ZOR will be 10 to the power 5. It will never exceed. Thereby, the time complexity is big off. And but we're using integers. We're not using longs. It's slightly better. Got it? So this is how you drive the interviewer from the brute to the better to the two optimals. And you tell him everything, everything that you know. And trust me, this is where the interviewer gets impressed. That's why I always prefer this method. Now, the interviewer knows that you know the optimal. But when you show all the facets of your thought process, he, he knows, you know, brute, you know, hashing, you know, the sum concept, you know, the long, you know, the ZOR one loop, you know, why ZOR is better, you know, everything. That's when he says, let's hire him. So coming back to the code editor, you have the code editor, the problem link will be in the description. I've written the same code. And the same what I'll do is I'll just say ZOR one, as I said, ZOR one, ZOR capital N. And I've taken the size as this. And now I will go ahead and try to submit this and see if it is running fine or not. It is, and all the test cases do pass. So I can go back to the sheet and we can mark it because this is done. And let's come to the next question, which is maximum consecutive ones. So what does the problem state? It's very simple. Maximum consecutive ones. You will be given an array of zero and ones. So if I have to look at the consecutiveness of ones, so there are two ones here, there are three ones here, and there are two ones here. So consecutive ones are these ones. So can I say the maximum consecutive ones is three? And that's what you have to tell me. Is that's what you have to tell me? So the answer is three. Now, how do you solve this problem? So this question comes up in an interview. Do you go the same way as brood better optimal? Now, if you start thinking about the brood better, I think that will take a lot of time because the optimal solution is very straightforward. So what do you say is, okay, as of now, I know that there are no ones. I have not figured out any ones. I'll keep a counter as zero, right? What I will do is I'll start iterating. Okay, one, increase the counter by one. So count of one, that means the consecutiveness is one. So the maximum gets updated. Okay, let's move ahead. The counter gets two. The maximum gets updated. Let's move. Oh, zero. Wait, zero means there's a break. 
is a break in the consecutiveness. If there is a break, do I still count? No. If there is a break, I fall back to zero because the consecutiveness is broken. So I fall back to zero. I'll again continue. One, again count. But is this one greater than the longest? No. So I do not replace. Then I move. Again I increase. Then I again move. Again I increase. This time when I increase, I get three. So the consecutiveness is three, which will be replaced. Because now we have three, which is better than two. Let's move. Zero. Again broken. Fall back to zero. Let's move. One. Let's move. Two. Is two greater than maximum? No. Iteration complete. When the iteration is complete, your maximum stores the maximum. And that's your answer. And that's your answer. So what is the time complexity? We go off n. Single iteration with just a minor if else loop will do it. So if I have to write the code, it's very simple. You're given the nums array. So what I'll do is I'll keep the maximum as zero. And this is the answer that I'll return. So we can return it. Perfect. And now I can keep the counter as zero as well. So keep the counter as zero. Now let's iterate for this. So which is like nums dot size. And I know if array or rather nums of i is equal to equal to one, the counter increases and the maximum will take the maximum of both. If it is not, then what happens? That means it's a zero. I fall back to zero again. Okay? Quite simple. One if, one else. And we are pretty much done. So I will quickly go and submit this. So if I submit this, this is accepted. So let's come back to the sheet and I can say that this problem is done. Now you'll be like, wait, this is looking something different. Yes. Why? Because previously there was this problem, find the row with maximum number of ones, which I moved into binary search. Why this? Because this problem will be involving binary search. And I just realized that I haven't uh, taught you binary search yet. So let's move it into the binary search. Now coming back here, we see that this problem has been split into two. So this problem is widely searched and I won't be covering this problem in this video. Why? Because I want my channel to be visible. I want new people to discover my channel. So I'll be making a separate video where I'll be covering both of these problems. First one is finding the longest sub array with given sum with just positives in the array. The next one is longest sub array with given sum which has positives and negatives in the array. Both of these I'll be covering in the next video. For this video, the last problem that I'll be covering is this one. So what does the problem state? The problem states you'll be given an array where every number appears twice apart from one number that appears once. So you have to find that one number that appears once. I think you know how to do it. We have already done a similar kind of approach in this problem where we were finding the missing number in an array using the ZOR concept. So over here, if you carefully see, 4 is appearing twice, 3 is appearing twice, 1 is appearing twice. And the only number that isn't appearing twice is 2. So the answer will be 2. Now I'll quickly move over this problem. Whenever this problem comes up in an interview, what is the brute force approach? The brute force is very simple. You pick up every number once. First you'll pick up one. And you will do a linear search on how many times one appears. And you'll find that one appears twice. So that's not your answer. Next, you will go to this one and you'll again do a linear search and say how many times do you appear. It will again be two. So that won't be your answer. Next, you'll pick up two and you'll do a linear search and you'll find that two appears once. So that will be your answer. How do you do this? You know the numbers like will be in the array. So the number will be no one but the array of i. That is something which I know. Now you'll again iterate in the array from 0 to n. And probably you can keep a counter equal to 0. And you can say if array of j, because you're iterating in the array, is equal to equal to number, you can do a counter plus plus. So once the iteration is over, if the counter is 1, that means the answer is this particular number. That's how easily you can do it. If I ask you the time complexity, again, quite simple n loop, n loop. So the time complexity is b go of n square because I'm picking up every element one by one, doing a linear search and counting it. And at the end, I'm comparing the count. So the time complexity is n square 
and the space complexity is bigo of 1 so that is how the brute force approach will look like so you are done with the brute force solution now the interviewer will definitely ask you to optimize this that's when you come up to the better solution please hear me out properly for the better solution because the concept of time complexity and space complexity will be well explained using this particular problem so better solution okay so the better solution will definitely be to use hash it. very obvious i just hash it and then using that i tell who appears smarts but then what data structure am i going to use to hash it let's analyze that so over here the maximum element that is kept is 4 so i can probably say if i create an array of size 5 then it will have the last index as 4 and i can probably initialize everyone as 0 i can probably initialize everyone as 0 and i can start iterating okay 1 okay 2 okay 1 okay 3 okay 3 okay 4 okay 4 so at the end of the day only this particular guy 2 will have an hash value of 1 and that will be the guy who is appearing once understood very simple but the question is what size of hash array do you define what size of hash array do you define and the answer is pretty simple the maximum element you define the hash array to be size of max element plus one over here it is four so you define the size of five very simple so can i say this can i say this first step if you are going to use an array for hashing will be to figure out the maximum element because without that you cannot create the hash array so maybe max c equal to array of zero let's do it and it'll be like max c equal to max of max c comma array of i and this will give me my max element very obvious and now i will define an hash array of size max c which is initially initialized to zero done now what i need to do i treat so I'll i trade in the map from sorry i trade in the array from zero to n and i'll say hash can you do at your place of array of i to be plus plus so kind of i can say this loop ends up taking b go of n this loop for marking will end up taking b go of n for sure now what's my job my job is to figure out who appears once who appears once so the best way that you can do is you can say hey listen hey listen I will probably start going from 0 to n again and I'll just say if hash of if hash of array of i is equal to equal to yes is equal to equal to 1 that array of i is my answer pretty simple yes and that's b go of n and that's b go of n so that's like b go of 3n and what is the space complexity can i say the space complexity is nothing but we are using an hash of a size maximum element of a size maximum and that is something which will depend on the input you cannot specifically say so the time complexity is 3n and the space complexity is this now you can argue that this b go of n can be trimmed why because over here it was like 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 the size was 7 you will end up at the worst case if 2 was placed at the last i repeat if 2 was placed at the last you will end up iterating for b go of 7 times i could have done it better i could have done it better if i would have iterated just from one like i know the minimum number might be 0 and the maximum might be 4 so if you could just iterate from 0 to 4, that will also do your job. And there will just be 5 iterations, which is better than 7 iterations. But again, what if instead of 4, 4, I had 8, 8. Then this loop will end up iterating 9 times, which is not good. So instead of this, this is better. So depending on the input, it will, it will vary. So you can tell that to the interviewer that, sir, I'm not sure depending on the inputs we like this is also okay if we use this this will be the complexity if we use the loop where we go from zero to max element and for every element we see how many times it occurs 
then it will be bigo of max for the last loop depending on what you're trying to use now the interview might say but can the hash array be used every time and the answer to that is no why the answer to that is no think on that imagine i tell you that the array has negatives the array has negatives can you hash negatives probably yes probably no but what if the array has uh, big numbers like 10 to the power 9 like 10 to the power 12 very very big numbers in that case in that case you cannot hash it you cannot hash it in a hash array that's when you have to use the map data structure with a bigger data type as a key with a bigger data type as a key and the value can be int so you have to use a map data structure and now this can be an unordered map in c++ depending on what map you use will the time complexity will vary now what can i say okay if i use map data structure i'll probably do the same thing but i'll reiterate assume i reiterate on one and the map data structure is empty i iterate one once one twice two once three once three twice eight once eight twice at the end of the day your map data structure will look something like this now you can iterate on the map and it'll be like okay key one how many times two next key two how many times one so this key is your answer this key is your answer iterate in the map and get your answer let's analyze again if i have to code it can i say the first thing will be very simple i'll just go from zero to n and i'll say map data structure can you do an array of i plus plus quite simple what will be the type complexity if we use an ordered map it will be n logarithmic of n where n is the length of the array and this n is the size of the map this n like probably you can write m this m is the size of the map okay but if you use unordered map the best case can be big of n i know the worst case of unordered map is big of n but that rarely happens so i can say big of n is the best case but the worst case is n like the unordered map might take big of n in order to find something so the worst case still can be n square if we use unordered map so you can tell that to the interviewer that this will not happen so we can use an unordered map but if you're saying that the inputs are very critical and the worst case can happen then i'll switch back to ordered map again i've explained this in the time complexity class so depending on what map you're using the time complexity will vary done what's the next step i'll just iterate in the map and that's very simple if you're doing c plus plus this is how you will be iterating the map if you're doing java you can definitely google or you can find it in the notes i know the value is what I have to check. So the value is always stored in the second parameter. So the second parameter is one. I'll say it dot first is my key, is my key, and that's my answer. Again, in order to iterate in the map, what will be the time complexity? Is my question to you. Very simple. The time complexity is how many elements did you store? Four. Where the size of the array was seven. Where the size of the array was seven, but you just stored four. It's like you stored n by two elements. Why? Every number appears twice. Every number appears twice. So the number of elements you'll store is n by two plus one. Why plus one? The one guy was appearing once. So this loop will run for n by two plus one because most of the number appears twice. So they're like, you'll take one occurrence of it. There's one guy who's appearing once. So this loop will run for this time, these many times, the worst case. The total over time complexity boils down to n logarithmic of m. But again, m is the size of the map. And the size of the map is n by 2 plus 1 plus b go of n by 2 plus 1 for this loop. And the space complexity will be b go of n by 2 plus 1 for a map data structure. Again, this logarithmic can vary if you're using unordered map for the best case. Better is done. If you tell these many things to the interviewer, he will be like, dude, I don't need to hear the optimal. <laughs> Anyways, let's go back to the optimal solution. Why? 
because definitely the interviewer will not be impressed with the extra time, a lot of iterations. So he might ask you to optimize this. This is when you give the optimal solution. So let's come to the optimal solution. It's very simple. What are we hearing? Every number appears twice. Twice, twice, twice. There's one who appears once. We have done the same problem using Zor property. What we will say is, okay, listen. Since everyone appears twice, if we do a Zor, they will cancel off. Is it? Yes, they will cancel off. So what we will do is, we will do a Zor of all the array elements. Because Zor clearly states, if they are same numbers, and if you do a Zor, the corresponding value is zero. So if you do a Zor of all the numbers, it's like one Zor one, Zor two, Zor three, Zor three, Zor eight, Zor eight. So what will happen is, this will club to give zero, Zor two, this will club to give zero, this will club to give zero. Zero Zor, zero Zor, zero Zor. So it'll be like zero Zor two. Zero Zor any number is the number itself. You got your number. And that means pretty simple. It's just a one line that you have to write. For Zor can be kept as zero. You can start from zero to n. And you can say Zor equal to Zor. Zor. Array of i. And your answer will be Zor. Because when you do an entire Zor, everyone will cancel. That one guy will be single. And he will be left as an answer. The optimal has a time complexity of b of n. And has a space complexity of b of 1. This is where you end the solution in an interview. So if you want to solve the problem, the problem link will be in the description. You can go and try it out and submit the code. So going back to the sheet, I can say that this problem is also done. And I'll be covering these couple of problems in the next video. So guys, I hope you've understood everything because my main focus was to teach you basics. I wanted to teach you how, how do you approach an interview in terms of brute, better, optimal, because it's you who's going to drive the interview. So please be careful about that. So with this, I can say that we have done 12 basic problems. After this, we'll be moving to the tougher versions of the problems. So mostly you'll find single video for most of the problems because these problems are searched a lot on YouTube and I want my channel to be visible. So mostly you'll find single uh, videos for the long, like the tougher problems. So with this, I will be wrapping up this video. But to continue our tradition, if you have understood everything, you got to you got to comment understood beneath the video. And yes, if you are new to our channel, please, please do consider subscribing to us. You can find all the links in the description. With this, I'll be wrapping up this video. Let's speed in some other video. Tell them bye-bye.